thank you for all you have. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 42 today. But you have to keep your Bible open because we're going to be in other chapters as well. This morning we were between Sunday school and church. I was out talking to folks and I come back by the glass doors and come in the foyer. And there was a little sparrow called a sparrow. We, we decided on what that was, a brown thrasher or whatever. It was just a little thing sitting there by the door. And I don't, Brian said maybe it flew into the door and was addled. I don't know. But I just reached down and picked it up, brought it in, showed it to Brian. He was alive, very much alive when I picked him up. He looked like he was just not with it. But when I picked him up, he was very alive and held him for a little bit. And I thought about that song we just sung, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Here I am holding him. And and I realized that that's what God is doing for us. He's holding us. He watches over the sparrow. He watches over us. And he holds us in his hand. And uh, after a little bit, I took him out. And off he went. <laughs> you know, but for the moment, there he there was by the door. And I went back in. And I sat at, this, at, the, at the desk in the office, church office. And, and lo and behold, if he wasn't pecking at the window <laughs> and singing right at the window, and I just bowed my head and I said, Lord, I don't know what you're saying today, but I get it. I get it. Thank you for your presence and your help and your providential care. He's so good to us. Amen. Genesis 42. And uh, we're going to jump into verse 35, and I'm going to try to shorten this message the best I can, because I could... Man, I could stay here a long time. Verse 35, And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in the sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said unto them, Me, you have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you'll take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben said unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons, if I bring him not to thee, and deliver him into thy hand, and I will bring him unto thee again. And he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way by which you go, then you shall bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. All these things are against me. Father, we bow because we need to. We need help. We need help to preach. We need help to hear. We need help to, we need help to listen and, and, and be in tune with what the Spirit is doing today. So, Father, help us today. We, we need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Jacob said, all these things are against me. Doesn't that sound familiar? Have you ever heard somebody say, if it can go wrong, it will? If it can happen to anybody, it'll happen to me. I'll be in the front of the line. I can't win for losing. I can't ever get a break. The deck is stacked against me. If, if you, have you ever heard that before? Uh, maybe, maybe you have been uh, yourself saying that at times. Maybe even this past week, maybe you thought it, maybe you said it, maybe you said it this morning, I can't win for losing. Sounds like Charlie Brown. Man, if it can go wrong, what was it, Murphy's Law, if it can go wrong, it will. There are times in life when it seems like we just go from one problem to another problem to another problem to another problem. Sometimes it's like Job on day one. Remember day one? It's just one runner after another after another in quick succession, and he can't even catch his breath, and problems are just devastation. And it just... And by the time one gets done, here comes another one. And sometimes life's like that, and just problems just roll in. Everybody at one time in their life is going to go through periods like that. Life's like that. I'm not going to cherry coat it and say it don't. Life, life can get brutal at times. 
Kind of like the lady I watched on the news that she was in Asheville and they were interviewing her and she said she had left Florida because of all the hurricanes and she went to Asheville to get away from it. And, it, and there it was, right? <clears throat> you can't win for losing. Study the biographies and, and, and lives of, of, of some of the most influential people and we look at them and think, man, they've made it, they've got a fortune, they've got the big house life. A lot of those people, you look at their life and study them and read the history of their life and you'll find there were dark periods in their life before they ever were successful. There was just devastation and dark times when they were ready to just give up all hope and, and, and quit. But life changed. Life changed for them. Our text takes us to a very low point in the life of Jacob who normally we would refer to as a man of faith and you read about him building altars to God and he goes from this point to this point and God watches over him and yet here we are in a text when he has just hit absolute bottom and deep despair. He's a defeated man and, and he's, just, he's just floundering in despair. Doesn't sound look much like a patriarch, does it? <laughs> Doesn't sound like those great men of faith in the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But here we are at one of the most lowest points ever in his life. Can I, can I just real quickly remind you that Jacob had 12 sons. He had daughters. We don't know how many daughters. We know one. But he had 12 sons. Those 12 sons will become 12 tribes of Israel. There's a familiar story of the setting there's a lot of jealousy and rivalry in that family. He had his favorite son by the name of Joseph. He makes this coat of many colors. They resent it, and there's a lot of bickering and fighting and dysfunction in that family. And it always, always seems to be that way when you play favorites, but that's what happened in that family. His brothers will sell Joseph off to a, a caravan of Ishmaelites headed to Egypt and off into slavery. And uh, they, bring this, they bring this coat of many colors back to their dad. They killed an animal and soaked the coat with blood and give it to dad and said, well, you know, you figure out what happened. It looks like a wild animal got him. And Jacob took it hook, line, and sinker and believed it. Years pass. Joseph is in Egypt. He works his way up the ladder. He becomes a, a manager in management position for a man by the name of Potiphar and uh, does well. And then there's false charges leveled against him. He ends up in jail, and, but then God is with him in jail. And then eventually he uh, interprets some dreams for a couple of fellas. And next thing you know, he stands before Pharaoh in Egypt and uh, God uses him. And next thing you know, he's prime minister over all of Egypt and he has went from rags to riches and God's been with him all the way. Now, you, you remember the story. They, his brothers lied about him to their father and said, uh, something got him. Years later, famine hits. Seven years of famine and hard times, economic cycle, downturn, disaster economically for Egypt because they're an agricultural society. So when there's a famine, this is depression at its worst. In the year two, uh, Jacob sends them boys down to Egypt to get grain because Joseph has had this food program going on now in the seven good years and now it's seven year, years lean and he sends them down because there's grain in Egypt and Joseph recognizes them. They don't recognize him. But in a series of uh, uh, treachery and trickery, you might say, with Joseph and his brothers, he, he keeps Simeon back and lets him go home but says, when you come back, you've got to bring ben Benjamin with you because you know the story. That is his blood brother with Rachel, you know, their, their mother. That, he wants to see Benjamin. But he keeps Simeon, sends them all back, and they're not, they can't come back unless they bring Benjamin. And that breaks us right to where our text is. They come back. They don't have Simeon anymore. They've got food. They've got their money still in their grain sack. And now they tell Dad what happened, and Jacob loses it on them. 
This is the worst that could ever happen. All these things are against me. And he's overwhelmed. Joseph is not. Simeon is now gone. And now you're going to take Benjamin? No. You, you can't do that to me. You'll, you, will, you will send me down to, with my gray hairs to the grave. All these things are against me. And yet you and I have the story. We, we've got our Bible. We can read it. You know, it's history now. And you and I know that it's not the worst of times. Matter of fact, they're right on the cusp of the best of times. Jacob, he can't see past his nose. He's not only going to see Joseph again, he's going to see Joseph's kids. He's going to see grandkids. He doesn't even know he's going to have. Him and the family are going to go to Egypt and they're going to live in the best of land, in the land of Goshen. It's the best, most expensive real estate in the whole of Egypt. Well watered, great pastures. It is prime real estate. They're going to get to live there in the midst of the worst of times. Simeon is not headed for execution. He's living large in Egypt. <laughs> I mean, he's just, he's taking it all in. He can't believe the life is this good. But Jacob is going to stand before Pharaoh. At 130 years old, he's going to stand and give a life story to Pharaoh. What he thought in his mind, we, it's, it's the worst thing that ever possible could ever happen. Right is, we read it, it's the grand finale of what God is doing with the family. And not only with that family, but God is intervening. And he's going to save millions of people in Egypt through Joseph. Many times you and I look at our life and we, we look at things and, and uh, we're kind of like Jacob. We, we think, well, what, could, what could be worse than this? And yet, give it some time, we look back and say, oh, what a blessing. I've known people, and you have too, that had uh, some crisis in health care they thought was a crisis, and they go in and they're going to have surgery, and we pray for them and all, and we think it's the worst, only to find out when they get in there, they find something else wrong that had they not had this issue, this issue would have killed them. But because they were able to go in and have this, they found that and was able to correct it and do surgery, and they were spared. We, we, we look at it and say, oh, I'm so sorry you've got to have surgery. But it became a blessing in disguise. Over and over and over, we see that a lot of times. What we assume is bad news turns out to be good news. So what you and I need is faith to let God heal our hearts. Now, I don't want to come off as somebody that's calloused and, and I don't care. And, and, and it can be easily done today. Reading this story, there's some real hurts here. Jacob misses Joseph. He assumes the worst. And I don't want to get past it, but all of us have had hurts and all of us have had disappointments in life. We know a little bit about loss. We, we've been there, done that. Some of us are living through it right now. So I don't want to come across as, as somebody that doesn't care. But let me remind you, Joseph, Joseph was 17 years old when he was sold off to slavery. Remember that? He was 17. When he stands before Pharaoh, he is 30 years old. Scripture tells us that. He's 30 years old. There's seven years of plenty, and then Jacob sends them boys men down to Egypt in the second year of the famine. We know that from Scripture. So if you do all the math, from the time he was sold till the time they stand before him is 22 years. There's 22 years have passed. In 22 years, Joseph has... It ain't been no picnic for him either, you know, he, is, he misses his family. He misses his father. He misses life with everybody. And here he is in a strange land, strange culture, and, and a strange language, and have to learn all the ways of Egypt. Strange gods. But he kept his faith, didn't he? Sold into slavery. He works his way up through Potiphar. And the scripture says that Potiphar handed everything over to him, and he didn't even know what he, what he had except what he ate on the table. It was all given to them. And then he ends up in jail. Bless his heart. You know, lied about and maligned, and he ends up 
false accusations, and he doesn't give up, does he? And he, and he follows, you know the story, and, and he does what God wants him to do, and he becomes uh, the warden over the jail. And he's forgotten about it. And all his good deeds, I mean, the people that he reinterpreted the dreams, they just forgot about him. But he doesn't give up on his faith. And then one day he stands before Pharaoh. All of that in the 22 years. And what is Jacob doing in 22 years? It's like he's stuck. He's just stuck. It's just like it happened yesterday. It's 22 years later. And he can't go on. He can't, he can't move on. He, he's just stuck in his grief. And sometimes, if we get so focused on ourselves, we miss what God's doing. And it's almost like for 22 years, Jacob, he, it's all about him. All these things are against me. There's a big family, isn't there? You know, they're hurting too. Yeah, they were culpable in all of Joseph, but, but they're hurting too. But it's all about him. When, when we're hurting, we need to give that all to God and say, God, help me. I, I don't like what happened, and I don't appreciate it, and I sure didn't line up for it, and I didn't ask for it, but it happened. They say time heals everything. Let me, let me tell you what. Time doesn't heal anything. It's what you do with that time. Joseph had the same 22 years. Family had 22 years. Jacob had 22 years. In those 22 years, Joseph moved on, didn't he? And moved with what God was doing. And Jacob is just locked in this, oh, woe is me. It's all about me. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Quickly move on. Number two, we need to take the long view. And now, when, when your life is upside down and everything's going south, we, we, are, we are just living moment by moment by moment. But if we could just step back and, and remind ourselves that God's doing something and set our affection on things above, catch our breath, take the long view five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years, and, and take that long view, read the back of the book, evil is destroyed, God is victorious, the church goes on, God's at work, the devil does not win. Take the long view. Jacob was stuck in his pain. God is unfolding something, not only for his family, but for millions in Egypt. Over and over and over, Jacob said it's all about him. Too often we can be like him and just get locked in on something. Lift up your eyes. Take the long view. Number three, have faith that God is in control. We, we memorize this verse. You know it. All things work together for good to those that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. We claim that. We quote it over and over and over. But do we believe it? All things work together for good. Jacob said, no, everything works for evil for me. Joseph in Egypt is claiming that. He's standing in that. He's in the Old Testament, but he already is a believer. Joseph will say in chapter 50, As for you, brothers, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Quickly, let me read to you a story. I have to read it or I'll mess it up. I don't normally read, but I have to read this. William Fryer, a retired Episcopal bishop from Colorado, retold this story. When I was a young man, I volunteered to read to a degree student named John, who was blind. One day I asked him, I got up the nerve to ask, how did you lose your sight? He said, in a chemical explosion at the age of 13. I asked him, how did that make you feel? He said, I felt like my life was over. I felt helpless, and I hated God for letting it happen. For the six first six months, I did nothing to improve my lot in life. I ate all my meals alone in my room. One day, my father entered my room and said, John, winter's coming. The storm windows need to be put on the house again, and that's your job 
You need to get that done. I want them hung by the time I get home this evening or else. And then my dad turned, walked out the door, slammed it on the way out. I was so angry. I thought, who does he think I am? I'm blind. How can I put up storm windows? And I was so angry, I, in my anger, I decided, well, I'm just going to do it. I fumbled through the house and out into the garage, and I found where the windows are always stored, the hammer, the nails, fumbled around getting everything lined up. I stumbled over and found the ladder, carried it out, went around the house again by hand, all the while muttering under my breath, I'm going to show them, I'll fall off the ladder, and then they'll not only have a blind son, they'll have a paralyzed son. He said, before the day was out, I had all the storm windows on the house. It took me a whole lot longer. I fumbled around, I dropped things, but I got it up. I never broke anything. I found out later, I found out later that never at any moment was my father more than four or five feet away from my side. He walked for me, with me, step by step behind me, quietly. He heard everything I said. He watched my fumbling steps. He understood my frustration. And he hurt as I tried and failed and tried again. In the same way, Jesus did not promise to spare us hurt, but he promised to always be with us. He said, surely I'm with you always, even and to the end of the age. You find that in Matthew 28, 20. Some people go through problems and they think that God is punishing them. Some people go through problems and they think that, well, it's a sign that God's not able to help them. And some people go through problems and think, well, God just doesn't care. Can I share with you that if God allows you to go into deep waters, it's only to deepen your faith, to mature you, to strengthen you, to sanctify you to purge you, to cleanse you. A little poem I love that found years ago by Robert Browning said, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but she left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and ne'er a word said she, but all oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. There's some things we just don't get and you never learn until one day you walk down a very lonely, dark, hard road. But in that moment you will find that our God is faithful and true and he loves you I've asked Ed if he would play a song for us and Ed if you'd come and we're going to close a little chorus that's in your hymnal page 575 I'm going to ask us all to stand I'm going to close with this if If you'd like to come to the altar this morning and pray about a need or about yourself, maybe something you've been hanging on to for a long time and God has said it's time to let it go. Or maybe you're in a real dark place in life and you just feel like you can't find the light or you can't touch bottom and you'd like to come and just kind of recommit your life to Christ and say, God, help me. Help me. I, I'm not one to put words in your mouth. If you have a need this morning, you feel free to come and spend some quiet moments with Jesus. Page 575. <laughs>
Father, we bow, we say thank you. Your hand is upon us for the grace of God that we enjoy, the goodness of God we partake in every day. Father, may we walk with such a steadfast obedience. Come good times or bad, we will always walk with you. Strengthen your church. Encourage hearts. Feed us, Lord, with what is convenient for us. May we walk with you in faith. Go out into this world, Lord, and live for you to the glory of God. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you for being here. Uh, go out into the world and be faithful and shine for Jesus. Thank you for being with us today.